Good morning, Gateway family, and thank you, Craker family, for doing that this morning live from Living Room Studio. Uh, we want to welcome you this beautiful Sunday morning. We get to come and gather in his name, and good morning, Gateway, and we want to, to keep reaffirming we're one church in hundreds of locations, uh, but if you want to get to know us, the best way you could do that is through our website. Go to gatewaywinnipeg.com, and as you click on that, you'll get to know all about us, and we would love to get to know about you. And thank you for uh, just following along with us on social media. And if you are new for the first time, the best way you can do is go to the website, click on our guest contact card, and that way we can get to know you. And you just put a little information about yourself, and we would love to connect with you. Now, I want to thank you so much. Uh, one of the things that we've really enjoyed about, uh, I mean, it's tough when you don't get to visit with people or see people on Sunday mornings, but we've been enjoying the live chat that you've been doing on YouTube. And so it's been neat to see you guys one anothering. And I want to post a challenge to you this morning. The challenge is to greet one another as many as you possibly can. See who could greet the most in the, the shortest time as possible. You'll have an hour to do that, so go for it. Um, we want want you to one another. Now, here's the reason why. Um, a couple months ago, before this all hit, we were talking, or actually, I was talking to someone who came new to the church, and they said this. They said, wow, you know, Pastor, your church is one of the most welcoming churches I've ever been to. And I honestly thought, wow, that is a huge compliment. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want the devil to rob us of an incredible blessing to be a welcoming church. So go ahead on that uh, ch live chat, say hello to one another, greet one another, and, and do that. Now, this morning, uh, we're going to go back to the Craker family, and they're going to lead us in worship from their, from their living room. It was really nice. Uh, Dawson and Jenny were talking about how it's so different trying to do church from your living room. And they gave a suggestion, said, what would it be like if maybe we led worship from, from our living room? We said, you know, this would be a beautiful idea. And so we're so thankful that they would do this for us this morning. But to do this, you, you realize it is a challenge. It's not the same, and we need God's presence. So we're going to just pray. I want to pray that God would actually meet you. And if you need whatever it is to be able to worship this morning, maybe stand, crank up the volume, do whatever you need to do to enter into the throne room of God, you can through his presence. So let's pray. Father, I want to thank you this morning that we are not separated from one another or from you because you have made a way through your spirit. And this morning, we can enter in boldly, but we need your help. We actually declare our desperate need. Lord, otherwise, this just becomes watching a TV screen. 
And Lord, I don't want the, at home anyone to experience that. We want to meet with you. And so, Lord, help us right now to enter your presence with thanksgiving our hearts and enter your courts with praise. Amen. Let's go back to the Craker family and let's worship the Lord. Good morning, Gateway. We're so happy to join you from our living room. We'd just like to invite you to worship with us as we sing through a few songs. Y'all ready? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here we go. we sing a lot in this family and uh, it's coming from a Bible verse did you know that from Matthew chapter 6 and this verse says therefore do not be anxious saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear for the Gentiles seek after all these things and your Heavenly Father knows that you need them all but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And so basically that verse is saying, we don't have to worry about all the things that we might worry about. Especially today, it feels like there's a lot we could be worried about. But we should be seeking first God's kingdom and loving God and, and trying to serve him and seeking him first above all these other things. And you know what? He's going to provide everything that we might need. Okay. So let's sing this song together. Okay? They, but we have to do the number first. Then you do it first and then we'll do it. Yeah. Let's all sing let's it together sing. first. Okay? Try it up with you. <laughs> seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness.
So should we try the round this time? No! Okay. We're gonna sing no, no, no. it. Let's sing it. You guys can sing it, Daddy. Okay, so Jared and Silas, you'll be on my team, okay? And Isaac and Emma can be on Mom's team. And the rest of you can all pick what team you want to start with. I'm gonna start first, and Mom, Jenny's gonna sing the Alleluia's. Yep. Here we go. You guys ready? Seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you.
isn't it good to be in the presence of the Lord? You know what? We, we take for granted God's protection and what he's been doing. And so, you know what? As you, before you just move on and stop, just make sure you just stop right now and just say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for what you've done. You, we know that you have made a way, you've provided for us, and that we can actually today come into shalom and peace, peace with God, peace in the midst of turmoil. So just go ahead and take that, take a couple seconds and just reflect and, and thank the Lord. It's so easy in our, in our times just to keep moving through us, even a service without reflecting. So go for it. I'll give you a couple, just a minute just to think about it. Lord, thank you that you promised to be with us to the very end of the age. And thank you that you, we can come and just be in your presence and feel that security. Lord, even when we feel like we're not singing the right tune or off key or whatever, it's fun that we can actually come to you because you're, you're interested in our hearts this morning. And so thank you we can do that. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, welcome, Gateway. And again, uh, one of the things we love to do is we love to be a people who are giving, and we know that this morning that God loves a cheerful giver. So if you're out there and you want to uh, participate with us in giving, you can do it a couple ways. You can just go onto our website. Uh, you can click in about middle of the road. It says down, uh, donate here, and you can click on that and donate. You can give a bunch of ways through our app, and you can just give on. And again, God wants to do it through a cheerful heart. So this morning, before you do it, give a big woohoo. Say hello and, and say God loves it when we are giving in a way that's blessing to him, not because he needs our money, but because he knows it's a part of our worship. Now, for those of watching on YouTube and that, we want to thank you for supporting us. And again, click on the like and or the subscribe button and you can uh, follow with us. And we want to thank those that are doing that. And also, if you can please sign up for our weekly uh, emails. Uh, this is the best way that we can keep in contact with you as we're going through this uh, coronavirus. Uh, that you, you want any information and things like that, we send it to you each week. So just go onto our website and click on that, and we will send you a weekly email. And finally, we want to thank Fiona and Nikki and Lucy for all the good work they're doing with the children's ministry. And uh, if you want any information or if you would like to be a part of, they're sending weekly uh, resources. If you would like some of that for your kids to be able to help do some uh, great stuff at home with them and teaching, uh, just send an email to them or, or get a hold of us through the website and we'd love to send you stuff. And speaking of kids ministry, we have a great video coming up for you right here. You know, a couple of months ago, our adopted Chinese son went on a trip back home to China to visit his family and friends. And he had a wonderful day on the first day that he was there, wandering around the city that he'd grown up in and, and meeting with all his acquaintances and family. And the very next day, he and everyone around him was plunged into enforced lockdown. Mm. COVID-19 had arrived in China. And we worried about him from afar. You know, we were in this sort of false sense of security and we were praying for his, his uh, safety and for an a, a international flight home, never imagining for one moment that that virus was going to sweep over China, sweep across the world, and it was going to find its way to Winnipeg, Manitoba. And that within two months, the entire world was going to go into quarantine. The entire world world. So many of you will relate to the shock and the disorientation and the incomprehensibility of that as this overtook us and became a global crisis. And we saw with such complete clarity the absolute helpless, powerlessness, and vulnerability of all mankind in the face of this pandemic. And any kind of human optimism or bravado or confidence that we may have had that we could just defeat this thing really quickly disappeared overnight as governments and healthcare workers struggled to uh, control and mitigate the rapid spread of this infection. So here we are now. We were trying to figure out it's the seventh week of seventh quarantine. Week, yep. 
And um, the initial shock has worn off, but the questions, concerns, confusions, and even frustrations have only mounted. Google trackers tell us that there's a surge, a spike in internet research about COVID-19 and all things surrounding COVID-19 just after midnight and early in the morning. And that tells us that COVID-19, for the most part of the globe, is the last thing we're thinking about at night. And it's the first thing on our minds mm. in the morning. Daily life for most people has been disturbed, disrupted, or completely devastated. And economies, world economies, have been devastated at the same time. There's tension that's high. And even when you go in grocery shopping, you walk around, you're kind of like, everybody's don't encroach on my two meters, please. And their eyes are darting around. And everyone seems to be on edge. Yeah, true. So what are the questions on your mind? If you're like me, you're asking things like, are these pandemic fatality projections really realistic? And how long is this going to last? And are part pandemics the new norm? And what's going to happen financially? Will we recover from this? Will life ever be the same again? Am I going to be able to graduate? Is remote learning the new norm? Will I ever get to travel again or be with my friends or family? And what about some of those conspiracy theories that are circulating? And all of the mixed contradictory messages that we're getting, are there some agendas? Is this the judgment of God? Did God actually send this plague? And is this the end of the world, like the Bible says in the book of Revelations? Or is it the end times? Where is God in all of this? And well, does we, he even care? We, we obviously don't know the answers to all those questions, but we do know the answers to some. The first one is, no, it's not the end of the world. Life will go on, we will recover, but it is the end times. In fact, we're living in the last of the last days before Jesus Christ returns. And the Bible tells us that in these last days, these kind of phenomena are going to accelerate. The second question, is this the judgment of God? Well, it may be. The Bible tells us God can cause plagues and pestilence and sometimes did in order to get people's attention so that they would turn back to him and depend on him. And whenever they cried out to God, he delivered them. And we also know from the last book of the Bible, Revelation, that God will judge the earth at some point. But is this God's judgment? Is really not the right question. The right question is, God, what are you saying in the midst of this global pandemic? And one of the things God is saying is, will you turn to me and depend on me? God certainly allows pandemics. He's sovereign and in control. But to be fair, pandemics are often a natural result of animals and humans interacting in a fallen world where sin and sickness and satanic power are at work. Like wars are a natural result of man's fallen state, his selfishness, his pride, his greed. So pandemics are a natural result of Earth's fallen state. Planet Earth is beautiful, but it's not utopia. It's not perfect. Earth presently exists in a fallen state and will continue in that state until Jesus Christ returns. Can we work hard and pray hard to stop pandemics? Yes. Absolutely, we must do that. But only Jesus Christ can redeem fallenness. And he begins with us. He begins with you and me personally. And we're here this morning to tell you some really good news in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of all the concern and all anxiety. We're starting a new series for the next few weeks called Encountering Jesus Today. And this morning we're starting with Where is God in a Global Pandemic? Mm -hmm. So that's what we'd like to do. We're going to ask you to turn, if you have a Bible with you, to Matthew 28, and we're going to go to verse 20. We're just doing one verse, and we're going to look at Jesus' last words. Last words are often very important and very revealing. 
In fact, there's a saying that is famous last words. And we're going to look at the last words of some famous people for a minute. Winston Churchill, one of the greatest leaders of the 21st century, or 20th century, sorry, and Prime Minister of Great Britain during the Second World War, his last words before he died were, I'm bored with it all. Rock and roll icon Elvis Presley's last words before he died were, I'm going to the bathroom to read. And he died in his bathtub. Actress Joan Crawford yelled at her housekeeper who was praying for Crawford right near the end of her life. She said, damn it, don't you dare ask God to help me. She was a very angry and broken lady. Famous jazz drummer Buddy Rich died while being prepped for surgery. The nurse asked him, is there anything you can't take? Buddy's last words were, yes, country music. <laughs> and John Newton, the former slave trader, become Jesus' follower and writer of the amazing hymn, Amazing Grace, said, I'm still in the land of the dying, but soon I shall be in the land of the living. Jesus' last words began with the word, behold, or lo. And I remember growing up, this was one of my mother's favorite sayings. She was constantly saying, lo and behold. What she didn't know was actually one of the earliest records of these words being written is actually in the Bible in the book of Genesis. Mm -hmm. And so you'll find lo or behold in all kinds of times in your Old Testament and in the New Testament, and especially in the book of Matthew, where that word appears 43 times. So that was an important word, and it basically is an exclamation that's designed to grab your attention. So behold is, hey, look, pay attention. Take note of what I'm about to say, because what I'm about to say is super important. And one of the first times it's written in Matthew is in chapter 1, verse 23, when God reveals the coming of the birth of Jesus Christ, his son. And he says, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And then a couple of chapters later, when Jesus is being baptized, Matthew says this, and behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I well pleased. So behold, always precedes something incredibly significant. And here in the very last verse of the very last chapter of Matthew's gospel, this word is found and Jesus himself uses it. And he says, behold, because he's grabbing the attention of the people that he's talking to before he ascended. So we know that the words that followed behold really mattered. It needed to be grabbed a hold of and absorbed because it was no random platitude. That's true. So what was so important that Jesus had to say? Jesus could have said, behold, be careful. It's a scary world out there. Or be safe, don't forget to wash your hands. Or remember, what would Jesus do? Or my favorite is, behold, hakuna matata. Don't worry, be happy. Or a simple, behold, I love you, see you later. But no, Jesus gave us the most wonderful, the most powerful last words anyone could say. Right here in Matthew 28, the very last gospel of the first book in the New Testament, Jesus is commissioning his disciples and sending them out into the world, and he leaves them with this last phrase in chapter, in verse 20, B, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Behold, I am with you always. Just a small sentence, but so profound. This would have been the most helpful, the most hopeful thing Jesus could have said to his disciples. Think about it. For three and a half years, they lived together. They traveled together. They walked together. They talked together. They ate together. They partnered with Jesus together in healing the sick, opening blind eyes, unstopping deaf ears, letting the mute speak, setting the oppressed free, the lame walk, raising the dead multiplying food, calming storms, feeding thousands. And then in one night and one day, Jesus was killed. 
The disciples must have been devastated. And then three days later, Jesus rises from, the, rises from the grave. The disciples must have been elated. And then Jesus leaves again and says, I'm going. I'll be gone. And he never came back. Think about it. Oh, no. I think the disciples were saying, what, is, what are we going to do? Jesus is our life and our purpose. We've given up everything to follow him. We're orphaned, we're abandoned, we're alone. But Jesus' last words must have been incredibly good news to those disciples. Behold, pay attention, look, I am with you always. Not only a promise, but a fact. The gospel ends not with the great commandment or the great commission, but with the great commitment. Mm. I am with you always. Not I was with you or I will be with you, but I am with you always. No break, no end to the duration, as long as the world lasts and ever after. And why would I want Jesus to be with me? Always. I don't know about you, but we've experienced some challenges being cooped up in isolation <laughs> with the same people in your bubble day after day, week after week now for six weeks. It's been challenging, at hasn't moments, it? At moments, at times. At moments, yes. Because people get irritating after a while. I like to eat those little oranges, you know, the ones that come in the netting especially the ones from Israel. They are delicious, but they're so small. You have to eat two or three of them to feel like you've really had an orange. <laughs> so I would go a few times a day, take my two or three oranges, I would peel them, and I would put the peels in the sink where our garburator is and let them pile up over the garburator opening. And then, the end of the day, I would garburate them all at the same time because it saves electricity, and noise, noise pollution. Well, unbeknownst to me, this started to irritate some people in my bubble. <laughs> and finally, the other day, one of these people said, what is your problem? Why can't you just garburate those peels right away? Why do you have to let them build up in the sink? Now, I know I knew what the answer was to that question, to save electricity and noise pollution. But I knew the people in my bubble were not asking a question. They were telling me I was irritating. But Jesus is not like the people no, in our bubble. Not at all. And he's not like you, and he's not like me. He doesn't get irritated like we do. Jesus is not just a teacher, not just a prophet, not just a really good person. Jesus is God. How do we know that? Well, the first evidence we know that is at Jesus' birth. Mary made reference to it a few minutes ago. Matthew 1 and verse 23. Jesus' name is Emmanuel. God with us. How profound is that? Not only that, but Jesus equated himself with God. In John chapter 10 and verse 30, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. This must have made the religious community pull their hair out. They actually picked up stones to throw at Jesus because he was blaspheming that he, a mere man, was claiming to be God. And not only did Jesus equate himself with God, Jesus referred to himself as God. In John 8, verse 58, Jesus says to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. They must have gone crazy when Jesus said that. Jesus was referring to himself by God's Old Testament covenant name, Yahweh. And that was the most sacred name. In fact, it was so sacred, they couldn't even let it come off their lips. And there's Jesus not only letting it come off his lips, he's saying, I am Yahweh. And that word Yahweh means I am that I am. 
It means God's existence doesn't depend on anyone or anything else. It means God is without beginning or end. It means God does whatever he pleases and whatever he pleases is right. Mm. And it means God is the most important reality and the most important person in the universe. Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. And then Jesus goes on throughout the gospel of John. He says, I am the bread of life. I'm the only one who can satisfy you. I am the light of the world. I'm the only one who can bring light to your darkness. I am the door. I'm open the way for you to God. I am the good shepherd. I feed you and guide you and protect you and keep you. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me shall never die but live forever. And I am the way, the truth, and the life, the only way to God. And I am the true vine. You are the branches. Not only did Jesus refer to himself as God, but he also received worship, which was reserved for God only. In Matthew 2, at Jesus' birth, we have the wise men coming, bringing their gifts and worshiping Jesus. And in John 9, when Jesus healed a man born blind, the man found him afterwards and said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped Jesus. And not only did Jesus receive worship, which was only received for God, reserved for God, the greatest evidence of Jesus being God is the resurrection. John 10, verse 17 and 18, Jesus said publicly that he had the power to lay his life down and the power to raise it up again. In verse 18, Jesus says, nobody takes my life from me. I lay my life down of my own accord and I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to pick it up or raise it up again. Jesus raised three other people from the dead, but so did Elijah. And Elisha, prophets in the Old Testament, they raised people from the dead. And so did the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter. They raised people from the dead. And there are many people throughout history and even presently today who have raised people from the dead. But no one in the past, the present, or the future has ever risen or will ever rise from the dead of their own accord. No one except Jesus Christ. No, Jesus is not like the people in our bubble. And he's not like you, and he's not like me. Jesus is God. And God is easier to get along with than you or me or the people in our bubble. Jesus is infinitely and always loving and kind and patient and good and encouraging and forgiving and gracious, and fun to be around, and joyful, and helpful, and powerful. And this Jesus said, I am with you always. And when Jesus says, I am with you always, what he's really saying is, I am enough for you. No matter what situation you're in, what circumstance, what challenge, I am enough. How is it possible to have Jesus with us? You see, God's intention has always, always been to be with the people that he created. He didn't create mankind and stand way far off in the cosmos and cross his arms and observe us as though we were something that was mildly entertaining. No, it's not like the song back in 1990 that Bette Miller used to sing. Some of you will remember this. It went like this. This is the chorus. God is watching us. And she did it with this radiant face. God is watching us. God is watching us from a distance. Really? That was the theology that was shaping the generation of the 90s. And she looks so happy singing it like it was good news. But it's not good news because it's not true. Not God is not now and never has been watching us from a distance. In fact, Luke declares to us in the book of Acts, he's not far from any 
one of us. We were not created to be isolated or separated from him. In fact, he created each one of us with a God-shaped hole deep inside. It's like a vacuum that can only be satisfied with God himself. We know, we know that something's missing, but we work so hard to try and stuff everything in there that's going to satisfy, but we're still left feeling empty at the end of the day. Most of us, if we're truly honest, can acknowledge that in the deepest, very most deepest part of ourselves, when we peel back all the layers in our spirits, we are longing for something far greater and far more powerful than ourselves. Have you ever noticed how fascinated we are with superheroes? You just turn on Netflix or the Disney Channel and you're barraged. We are obsessed with being rescued from a dark, evil being. And the problem with the superheroes, similar to the Avengers, is that they fly in to rescue us and they do the job and they make a terrible mess, but then they head off to their own worlds because they don't actually care that much about us. But God's not like that. God wants to be with us because he loves us. He places great value on the people that he's created. And he wants us to be his family. He's made that clear from the very earliest records of documented history of God's interaction with people. Because he said, I will be your God and you will be my people. The problem was never on God's end. The separation was always our issue. From the beginning we were like, hmm, I don't think so. I think that I know myself better. I know what I want. I know what I need. I know what's good for me. So, hmm, I don't think so, God. I don't really want you in my life. I don't think I need your care. I sure don't want your intervention. And so I'm going to say no thanks, God. I don't need you. Only look at where that path has gotten us. People can't get along. People can't stay married. They can't love their neighbor, let alone love other nations. We make war. We exploit. And look at us. We are in the process of completely trashing our planet. And we only have one because we're greedy and we're selfish. And now look at us. We're stuck in our homes in quarantine while 200,000 plus are dying from a tiny invisible virus. So much for our amazing human prowess and our ability to create our own destinies. Mm. We are truly helpless without God. And this pandemic has only underscored that. But in spite of our stiff arming saying no to God, he has loved us relentlessly. Mm. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to the earth, who took our sin and our separation and our judgment upon himself when he died on the cross. And then he was raised to life. And what he did in that incredible act of sacrifice was that he opened the way for us to be reconnected, reunited with God. And he broke down the wall that was between us and enabled us to say yes to God. And when we believe in Jesus Christ and when we receive him into our life, he says to us, nothing, nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ. Not trials, not distress, not persecution, not famine, not nakedness, not sword, not even pandemic. His presence is peace and he is with us always. Like Bette Midler, uh, I grew up believing that God was watching from a distance. My family wasn't religious. I, I, I didn't have any idea about Jesus Christ. In fact, there was an elderly couple who lived in our neighborhood where I was growing up, and they were religious, and they knew something about Jesus, but we just thought they were weird. As a young adult, I came home from university one day, and our house was empty, which was very unusual. After a few minutes, the phone rang, and it was a neighbor, and they said, how's your mom? I said, what do you mean? There was an awkward silence. They said, Oh, I guess you don't know. An ambulance took your mom to the hospital. Now, we had no cell phones back then, so there was no way my family could get in touch with me. But when the neighbor said that, fear gripped my heart. I felt devastated. I never saw my mom conscious, alive and conscious again. 
She died of a heart attack at 45 years of age. She left three kids and a husband behind. And, and none of us knew how to cope with the grief or loss. We, we, we just didn't have anything. We just tried to get through life. I felt abandoned. I felt alone. I felt orphaned. I started to think about spiritual questions. What's the purpose of life? Do you just live and die? And when you die, what happens to you? Where do you go? And is there a God? Is he real? And if he is real, why does he let these kind of things happen? Over the next four months, a new friend I had met at university who had become a new Christian kept inviting me out for coffee. And I kept saying no and making excuses. I just didn't want to go. He was persistent. And I just kept making every excuse possible until finally I was so embarrassed to say no again, I agreed to go out. And that Thursday night, changed my whole life and my future. We went into a Denny's restaurant in Edmonton and we started to talk about Jesus. And I realized Jesus wasn't a religion. He was a real person. And then Jesus came into the restaurant, not physically, but tangibly. I could feel him. I knew he was there. I knew he was real. And I experienced two powerful and supernatural things that evening when I encountered Jesus. I experienced Jesus' love and Jesus' joy. I was filled with his love and joy. Those feelings of abandonment and loneliness and or feeling like an orphan were gone. I felt like a new person. I had met, encountered the resurrected Jesus Christ. Well, I discovered that day and every day since the truth of Jesus' last words. I am with you always. Now, this is just the beginning, the introduction to the good news that we want to share over these next couple of weeks. And Mary is going to pray for us now. Father, thank you for your incredible love to us. Thank you that you are not a God who is distant, yeah. disengaged, detached, or indifferent to us. That you love us. You have set your heart upon us. And you sent your son when we had even said no to you. You made a solution for us. And we're so grateful. Lord, for those today that are on a journey to finding you who may be sitting in their homes and the isolation that has been set upon them, and they're wondering about you and they maybe have some questions and they're opening up to maybe hearing the story about your life. I pray that you would run to them and that you would speak to them and that you would assure them of your presence with them and your longing to be reconnected with them. And Lord, for those who are also in isolation and who have found you, I pray for such a richness of the power of the Prince of Peace who overshadows and shelters beyond what our four walls can do and that you would provide and you would sustain and you would lift each one of us. And we thank you for your great, great love. Amen. Jesus being with us begins with believing and receiving Jesus. And you can do that right now wherever you are. We're gonna put a prayer up on the screen just a simple prayer that turns to Jesus because he's near. He is not far away. He's not distant and he's not disengaged. He knows who you are. And you can pray that simple prayer sincerely from the heart. And Jesus, promise, will be your experience. I am with you. And when Jesus is with us, everything changes or you can go to our guest contact card and our website, gatewaywinnipeg.com. You can press that card, fill out the details. We'll get back in touch with you. And we can introduce you to Jesus or we can send you resources that will help you grow in a relationship with him. Over to you, Norm.
you know, this is for us the desire of our heart that you would have an encounter with God, that Jesus is still alive. He's meeting us today. It's been neat as I'm looking at all the chat line, people saying, I feel God's presence. Isn't God's presence here with us? And you too can have God's presence. I feel that that's the call for us this morning, that you do not have to be alone. And I think as this uh, pandemic goes on, we realize the things that we look to as comforts. Yes, even Netflix after a while gets, uh, <laughs> comes to a place where it does not fulfill. It truly doesn't satisfy. And yet Jesus came to give us life and life to the full, even in the midst of a pandemic. So we want to thank you for joining with us this morning, for being a part of a, our service. We thank you, all those that joined us online. There's been, as we've been going through, it's been neat to see people across Canada joining us and uh, around the world, actually. And it's neat because, again, God is greater than anything that could be thrown us. And as we uh, gather together in his name, he's right there in the midst of us. Now, a couple quick things I just want to mention again. Thank you for all those that are joining with, with us. And you can check out us on Facebook. Uh, that way you can get a hold of us or put in a post of any of the uh, photos you have and things like that. And again, check us out on our website. And as well, if you have any needs, if you have any needs that you have or would like to help with others, go to our website, click on uh, our button there. It says, I have a need or I'd like to help with a need. And that way we could get you linked up and helping with other people. And in closing, I just want to pray because... It feels like this. This morning, Ron and Mary gave a beautiful message to share the importance of Jesus. But there are many around us that don't know. And we, I, we want to pray that many in this season would come to know the precious blood of Jesus that was died on a cross for you and I, that nothing could separate us from. So we're going to close with that. Father, we thank you. I know that you are truly near. And I thank you, Lord, for this promise. Behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. So, Lord, today, help us to receive that. Help us to walk in that. Help us, Lord, to be able to fix our eyes and gaze upon you. That, Lord, even in the midst of this, your presence would be right with us at each day in our bubble. And you would invade our bubble. We give you permission. And we thank you for this beautiful day we could worship together. In your name, amen. Well... Have a great week. Make sure you text one another.